Yeah, hi. So we are group five and we discovered um, like our topic was how to support power system models and choosing, choosing the appropriate methodological data. So it's in the direction of, of finding a link between um, power system models and clim climate data sets. Um, our group contains um, Jaap, Johannes, Eugenio, Sadie, Bruno Schiska, Bruno Schiska, who was the original organizer, and me, who um, supports like who helps today's presentation because Bruno is unfortunately not cannot be here today. So I, I, I tried to the best to, to replace him. Um, next, please. So the project idea was, as I, as I told, to, to make this, this bridge be, and between meteorological data and, and, and the output data from power system models. For this purpose, we used various meteorological data sets, mainly the, the, the data sets from, from Schlott, which um, contains the, the Eurocortex um, data. So three data sets from, from the Eurocortex. And um, based on these, we, ca um, we, we provided different capacity factors for the renewables and used Pipes of Europe as a power system model in a one node per country setup to, to find um, output data, which are for our case, the capacity factors. So there's like a capacity decision inside the model and um, the dispatch as well as the levelized cost of electricity. So in total, we had like three climate models which span a, a time horizon of, of from 1970 to 2001 in, 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 in chunks of six to eight years. So let's directly dig into the data. I think this is for you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we cannot hear you if, you, if you're saying something. Uh, sorry, I was on mute, sorry. Um, so you can hear me now, right? Yeah, it yeah. now works. Yeah, so, um, okay, again, so I think the, the main part of the week was for, for all of us to get to know the data, see what we can, what we can do with them. Um, and for example, here we have, the mean capacity factor for upwind and onwind in the first two, two rows. Um, and as you can see, in all models, we have slightly different um, capacity factor, which makes sense. But then also with the installed capacity in the lowest bottom and uh, in the lowest row, um, there are also different results with um, different input values, right? Um, and it's interesting to see that even though, for example, for Germany, we have not too bad capacity factors of onwind and upwind, but we have almost no in, uh, capacity installed in the, in the results. Um, so I think these were the two parts where we looked or where I looked into. Um, so we have different difference in the models in the first step. We also see this in the result when we look at the installed capacity for each generation. Um, these plots show the norm normalized difference to the first periods to get, to get them compared because the scales are very different between these carriers. Um, and we see that, for example, in the first model in the e ICATC, there's always an increase in the solar power Whereas for the other models, there are also periods where we have a decrease in solar power. Um, then we have the same thing for the levelized cost. And again, for the IC, ICHEC, we have an increase in levelized cost for all the models. And for all the models, we have slightly, yeah, we have different results. Um, and especially for the Levelized cost per carrier, you can see that for the gas turbines, the OCGT, there's always a decrease in most of the periods for the model, for the second and third model. And I think, or we think that this, um, because the gas turbines are always used at full, um, full capacity, or not, they're not used at full capacity, but they're deployed in full capacity because this is a threshold. The, so the CO2 emissions are a threshold in the model. Um, so yeah, so we have 
uh, to summarize, we have different models, we have different regional aspects in our data, and yeah, so now say, Louis, say something about the time series in those models. Uh, hi, there. can you hear me? You're very low. Am I? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, I'll try and speak better. loud. Am I yeah. audible at least? Oh, yeah. very much now. Very good. Yeah, excellent. Um, I think I've put my video on and I can't see myself. Um, yes, so um, we also investigated uh, the input data with focus on uh, the generated capacity factor, uh, namely the, the maximum and the minimum output for, for each snapshot per unit of nominal power in optimal power flow. Uh, in particular, I want to present to you some uh, results for autocorrelation values uh, and indications as to, to how they might uh, vary with the lag uh, of the autocorrelation. So for those unfamiliar, autocorrelation measures the, uh, the degree of correlation of a given variable across uh, two successive time intervals. Uh, so it kind of quantifies how the, the lagged version uh, of variables related to, to the original one um, in, its, in its time position in the time series. Um, so we have multiple uh, multi-dimension data to consider. Um, so we've got three different models, we've got over 100 different country and, and power data type uh, combinations, uh, and between I think like 15 and 20 time periods, each covering six years. So first of all, just to show you a slide where uh, I take a specific um, um, element from from that um, um, from, the, from the data. So in this case, we've got um, autocorrelation uh, functions, so ACFs, if you've heard of those, um, shown for the case of uh, so Austria, AT, uh, on wind, um, and that's the, the maximum, not the minimum, and that's for the period uh, 1970 to 1976 and the MPI model uh, as a demonstration. So that sort of put, puts into context um, what I'm going to show in the next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so now to return to that full date set I was, I was talking about. Um, uh, and to demonstrate some patterns that, that I, I saw emerge in the, in the autocorrelation values at, at given lags. Um, so, of course, for a, a capacity factor, um, uh, a time series of relevant lags correspond to, to days and weeks, months and years. Um, so here are, are three of those shown. Um, and I'll apologize, first of all, for the, for the tininess of the, the axes labels. I very much doubt you can read those. Um, so I'll try and talk through um, what I'm showing here. Um, so on the y axis, we have the various uh, time periods um, increasing in time as we go down. So, for example, the first data point on the x axis uh, at the top there would be 1970 to 1976. Uh, the bottom one would be like, I think, 2070 um, to 76 or something along those lines. Um, on the uh, x axis, we have these various uh, country and data type combinations. So for example, I think the first one's like 80 uh, on winds, Australia, uh, sorry, Austria on wind, uh, as I think was the example I showed in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, Pat and I just wanted to, oh, sorry, I should say that, yeah, that the actual value's been shown. Again, the color scale is very small. Um, so black um, is towards zero, then going through purple, orange and yellow towards white uh, goes up to, to one. Um, for the, the possible autocorrelation values. Um, and a general pattern you might see with the stripes, this is basically just the, the arranging on the x-axis by country and data type. So the, the lighter stripes tend to be uh, solar, I think. And um, just let me, let me look at my larger plot so I can actually read those. Yes, yeah, so solar and uh, run of... Um, runoff river hydroelectricity um, are, the, are the lightest stripes generally for the daily lag. Uh, the more interesting um, autocorrelations tend to appear with the, with the, the high lag, so weekly lag, yearly lag. Um, in fact, I might demonstrate that on the next slide, if you don't mind, if you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is the yearly lag for all three models. Um, so before we were just doing different lags for the same model, I think it was the IC, HEC model. Um, in this case, uh, what I want to show is an interesting pattern of um, that in each case of the model, uh, the autocorrelation um, for um, some countries, not, not every country, but for certain countries for the, for the runoff uh, river hydroelectricity is so noticeable um, uh, as time increase, these time periods increase, the autocorrelation reduces. Uh, and I was thinking that could be an in interesting feature to investigate in the uh, input data going forward. But, um, unfortunately ran out of time. Um, but I think, yeah, there's quite a few different aspects of that 
uh, incorporated in that plot that could be investigated further as potential features to um, as per our project goal investigate um, as to whether they have some sort of correlation with uh, the outputs uh, thanks I think we're going next to uh, is it Eugenio or yeah, yeah you yeah oh, it's yeah, it's me. Thank you. Just, uh, just for info, you're at 10 minutes now, but... Okay, thank you. Yeah, so just very quickly, I want you to imagine this plot as three-dimensional plots. Each, each column is a three-dimensional plot that represents the uh, kernel density estimation of the, of the variables. And uh, we did it pretty much to get another view of the topology of the concentration of the different... Um, uh, of the different uh, variables that we have and how they might relate. Uh, in this case, it's the relationship between the um, optimized capacity and the capacity factors. And what I, I think we found more interesting is just in solar, there is like a P modality in the distribution of the variables that uh, doesn't directly reflect into the um, capacity shares that, that were produced by the, by the model. Uh, so that's why the, the lower part is a little, little bit like uh, flat, but yes, this is. Uh, I think this 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 uh, this representation is kind of almost like an histogram. It helps us to get an view of how the variables are distributed. But what else is also interesting? Can you go to the next slides, please? Is that using this same representation, we could actually f find that by for the solar power this um, bimodality was also kept for the for the liberalized course of electricity so i think this is something to keep looking at in the future for any any further in, uh, research around this around this and in the other and the other areas i think we get some important information on topology and the differences between the models but i think this is the most uh, important things that we found out from this and i think we can go to the next one it's from who is going to say this? I think it's Johannes. Hey, so one more metric we used was the correlation. Oops, uh, can you go back for a second? Thanks. Uh, it's, yeah, another metric is the correlation. And a very nice way to visualize this is with correlation matrices. Uh, I wrote a notebook that constructs those and it's included in our GitHub repository. Okay, next. Uh, thanks. So when I did that first for energy model, I ended up with a not very comprehensive matrix. So after grouping it per energy carrier, which is on the next slide, we got this matrix, which still contains a lot of user's information. So after narrowing it down again, we get to the next slide. We end up with uh, this matrices and there's two approaches one is to look at each model respectively which i did here one thing to take away is that for the mpi model there's a strong negative correlation of onshore wind capacity and solar capacity factor while for the other two models this is positive so that's something worth investigating further the other approach we took is to aggregate the data of all the models so that we have more data points and see if you can find a more generalized correlation effect on the next slide. So you get this matrix. Um, yeah, it's important to say that also this holds a lot of information and some insights can be derived from it. You still need a lot of background information on how your respective energy system model works and what restrictions are implemented to make any sense of it. Thanks. Yeah, another strategy we we applied was to um, group all the data we have, so from a different from a different models, and then then to, to check like what hap what what occurs together. So like this data, for example, shows all all the points where the levelized cost of electricity for onshore wind power in Denmark is below the median, so like very very low cost of electricity and. What is interesting here is that the average capacity factor is for different countries as well very very high, and for for solar, if you if you, if you just simply count, count count the capacity factors, you can see that it's, it's less deployed. So this is very very something we just started, I think, 
So like this is something we, we want to explore further how what what if you can draw some some conclusions from from this approach of, of analysis. Um, next slide. So to conclude, we, we just think that this is like a, like a first step into into the direction. So I think we all like underestimated how, how difficult it is to, to make this link between uh, climate data and, and power system models. So we want to extend this with further data also to explore the data a little bit more. So currently we just, um, we mainly focus on the power system data and not so much on the, on the climate data. Um, Sadie made a very nice um, first step into the direction of exploring the data, but there's definitely much more in the different data sets. And further, we want to use more, more data sets to also increase the robust, robustness of, of, of everything we said, because technically we now only have three data sets. So we expect like with more data sets, the results get more robust. And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the uh, round of applause again. Uh, so if you've got questions, please put your hands up or say in the chat. I mean, I uh, picking up on, maybe I can ask a question quickly, picking up on that, um, that comment you, you were talking about sample size there at the end um, with the with the output from the different climate models um, did you did you have kind of one realization from each climate model um, as in kind of one you know one time series essentially um, going through your period or did you have you know, um, increasingly climate models will be run in an ensemble where you have you know several different realizations of the same time period So yeah, you... so I think currently it's only like the, the three different Euro codecs we, we just showed, but it would be definitely be more interesting to also to, to include more different, also different realizations, but also different climate models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting because I mean, it seems, you know, it seems like you can see some differences between your, your different climate models and I'm, you know, and I'm sure there are really important differences between the climate models, but, but equally you can, you know, you can get differences if you just run the same model twice over the same period, you, you will get some differences due to natural variability. So, um, so yeah, it's another kind of angle to in include in the future, but that would, you know, that would help give you some error bars, I guess, on some of those things. Um, uh, yeah, uh, great uh, question from Hannah. Hi, thanks guys. It's a lot of data analysis you've done there, those massive great matrices. Um, so, this might be a question for Bruno, but maybe one of you can answer it. So, so similarly, those climate model simulations you picked, like there are loads of Euro Cordex models, right? And you picked three. Were they picked to be purposefully like spanning different situations? Do, do you know much about those models? Like if you would expect them to give a really broad range of results or not? So I, I think those those data sets uh, were chosen regarding with respect to, to a paper done by by Schlott in 2018, and I think the purpose why we used them was because the power simulation was already done. So I think this is the data set, data set we have, but I'm not sure if how how they picked them. So I don't know if Matthias knows more about this, but yeah. So I guess. I, I also don't know why they picked them, but I just know that, that the like the the data sets which they are they are very extreme definitely. So like they're at least very um extreme cases of of, of weather of, of climates of climate simulations. Mm -hmm. But I think Bruno would know more why they picked in the initial paper why they picked those three. Yeah, that's right. So I think there it's a very strong warming scenario, right? So it's the RCP 8.5, which is a, you know, it's a very it's very pessimistic in terms of in terms of any you know changing energy systems. Um, it, it assumes a lot of uh, a lot of greenhouse gas forcing. Um, yeah, yes. yeah, it'd be interesting following up on this to see, um, you know, are the models you know very different from each other in, in today's climate, right? So just for the you know, for the early part of your time series where you're simulating today's climate is there, you know, do they have different biases um, in representing reality, which could maybe be, be taken account by some kind of simple correction procedure. That, that might be interesting. Um, yeah. uh, a question from Stephen. Just a quick one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's great to see loads of analysis being done, actually. 
Um, just going maybe back to then the, the, the topic of what you're doing, which is choosing appropriate meteorological data. From that analysis you've been doing then, what, what are some of the things then did you, did you, that came out of the analysis you think are kind of maybe the most important things you've seen so far? I guess you can go deeper into it later, but um, across all that. So maybe if you go back to the correlation matrix, the last one. So um, I think uh, now my Zoom thing is uh, blocking it. Wait <laughs> a second. Okay, so the wind capacity factor. So the models are optimized with regards to the uh, total LCOE, like to get the level as cost of electricity as low as possible. So if you look at the on-wind capacity factor, it's Z factor, at least in this model, that is that has the strongest negative correlation. So we can say that the higher the on-wind capacity factor is, the lower will be the level as cost of electricity. On the same uh, side, if you look at it, the on-wind capacity factor, if you go to the top of it, I think it's the force of the top, on-wind capacity factor again, yes. You can see that it is also negatively impacting the on-wind share. So this means that obviously with a higher capacity factor, the model says that you need to build lesser wind generators. And then if you look at the on-wind generation, which is somewhere in the middle on the left side, yes, exactly. You can see that the on-wind capacity factor has no correlation with the actually generated on wind. So obviously, again, this comes down to the installed wind generators being more effective. They have more full load hours, basically. So this is the factor that we can see now is the most um, strongly correlated. So the next step would be to look at how this on wind capacity factor is calculated for the energy system model, like which methodological input data is actually affecting the capacity factor. Right, okay, thank you. I think given time, we should probably move on. So um, so thank you very much to group five, lots of, uh, lots of great analysis there. Um,